Thinking Basketball Podcast. My name is Ben. Welcome back to another episode of the uh, 2023 playoffs. Did I throw you off, Cody, with that introduction? Yeah, I feel like I'm on an NPR podcast. Like, you really leaned into that intro. Like, oh, my pitching a new book today is that what we're going to be talking about ben that's what i was going for because i'm i'm pretty sure my voice is uh is failing me in the afternoon here as we record on monday may 8th uh we are i mean i don't know are we like halfway through the playoffs the playoffs have been going on for a long time they're going to continue to go on for a long time and if you're listening to this here's where we're at 2-2 boston and philadelphia 2-2 Denver and Phoenix, 2-1 heading into tonight's death match at, at the Staples Center between the Lakers and the Golden State Warriors. And there's one more series. The Heat and the Knicks also play tonight. They are also 2-1. A lot of drama. Today, today we're going to get to some of these series and continue to uh, pick up where we left off. We were a couple games back in some of these series. We're going to talk about some uh, tactical adjustments and some of the weekend games that were so stunning. Um, but before before we do that, Cody, before we do that, I want to take stock in how we're feeling about some players mm -hmm. in the postseason. You know, you get to the playoffs, the games get more intense. I love the physicality. We've talked about how the officials have let them play a little bit more and what that's done. Um, advanced sort of scouting and scheming for players. And it's it's the cauldron of the postseason. It's, it's where the rubber meets the road. Some guys step up. Some guys wilt a little bit. Let's, let's talk about it. Let's talk about after, you know, roughly what, eight or ten games for a lot of these guys, whose stock is up, whose stock is down. I love that. And I think what makes this particular discussion difficult is you don't know how much you you pay attention to one particular playoff series. Like a couple I mean playoffs in general. Like someone might be having an excellent playoffs or a bad playoffs and you're like, "How much am I folding in the previous two years? Is this just who they are?" So it's it's fun to try and balance those things to come up with a a composite stock option. Well, the the motivation for this question uh, I think is obvious to anybody who watched the Denver Phoenix game yesterday or the Den Denver Phoenix game before yesterday and, and that is the white hot play not red hot not red red hot mm. we have to repeat I know some physicists listen to this show we are going with white hot Devin Booker who um, is averaging like 36 or 37 points per game in this series after having a great first round he's on an unbelievable heater. So we want to talk about how to contextualize that, what it means. I don't know how you feel. Um, I'm stock up, obviously, on De Devin Booker based on his performance. But the question is, like, I think some people are taking the stock up and they're taking it all the way to the ceiling. And here's the thing. If Devin Booker plays like he did in the last few games at face value, if he continues to play that way, then I agree. You have to talk about him as the best player in the league because he's like... If you pull up the stats, it's like peak Michael Jordan and peak LeBron James are most of the other players scoring at his proficiency. Part of the stock up for me with Devin Booker was before this series, I thought his defense has been a little better this year. So he's improved in that area. And he's still limited. We talked about it in the video from the first two games back in Denver. He's still somewhat limited as a playmaker and even a ball handler in terms of uh, pressure and some of the vision and things like that. But playmaking very well in general, using that scoring, I would say his decision making with when to shoot, when to pass, when to move it along. And especially these last few games since the series has gone back to Phoenix, the skip pass has been something that he's used more of, which really helped uh, Den uh, Phoenix against the Denver defense, especially in game four. So that's the motivation for all this. But before we try to contextualize what this means, I have, I have a Booker number Ooh. that I want to share with you. Please. Uh, Devin Booker made his last shot of game two. Made his last shot of game two. And then... It was 20 of 25 in game three. Not sure if you remember that one. And uh, heading into the fourth quarter, he was 14 
of 17 on his shots in game four. He actually only took one shot in game four. Part of that was rest for minutes. Part of that was the coverages and him just continuing to move the ball and the Suns uh, getting looks. And that's, that, of course, is why Landry Shamit ended up with so many of those dagger threes. And Landry Shamit himself didn't miss. We'll, we'll, we'll talk more a little bit about this series, I think, at some point in this episode. But, Cody, that stretch I just described from Kevin Booker. From, from Kevin Booker. Devin Booker. <laughs> let's try that again. Um, he took 43 shots in that period from the end of game two to uh, the start of the fourth quarter in game four yesterday. He took 43 shots. The man made 35 of them. He went 35 of 43. That is 81%. That is a video game. Uh, that is, I'm just sorry, that's not sustainable. That doesn't make sense. I'm pre- Can Elias get on this? The Elias Sports Bureau. I have been watching basketball for a long time. I do not think I can ever remember a 35 of 43 stretch from anybody other than like a dunker or a low volume player. And here's the best part of this, okay? Here's the best part of this. He took eight shots at the rim. Oh my God. He was 28 of 35 outside of the basket area. That's 80%. He was 20 of 23 on his mid-rangers, Cody. He he shot 87% on mid-range shots. 20 of 23. The dude was so on fire that he hit those double pull-up threes against double teams at the end of the third quarter to end this stretch. And that's fitting because if you looked at all his long shots, long mid-range twos and threes, Over that stretch, he was 14 of 18, 78%. Any way you cut it, it's all around 80-something percent. And that's like the, let me just remind you, that is the percentage of a great free throw shooter, 80-something percent, not a long-range shooter uh, against playoff defenses and sometimes double teams. I know you have some numbers that you want to share, but... um, I don't think I've ever seen a shooting display like that. And he literally didn't miss. He, he, he missed eight jump, seven jumpers in two games. I feel like he was making, you know, he had like those transition opportunities where he'd pull up and just like keep floating from like, I don't know, 13, 14 feet away. Every single one of them went in. I'm going to back up for a bit and go to that skip pass for a second because I, I think we talked about it probably the last episode where a key a key to beating the Nuggets defense is for them to take advantage of that skip pass. And there was one, I think it might have been the last of four of Shamit's three-pointers that he made in the fourth quarter. I think the Nuggets came to double-team Booker, and he gave this nice look look off the defense, throw skip to Shamit, buries it. And I was like, okay, he's on one. He's starting to figure out the defense. So I'm interested to see how the Nuggets shift away, or how they adjust, I should say, uh, against that, because clearly they can't be letting Shamit get open shots like that. But Ben, if we're going to talk about Devin, the pressure cooker, Booker, we have to talk about just how hot and how quickly he gets hot out on the court. Right now, Ben, (laughs) according to your database, I'm thinking basketball.net, about 32 points per 75, plus 14.7% better than league average. I want to give you some context, Ben. I brought those numbers down just a little bit across every playoffs in the history of basketball, according to your database, and I looked at everyone that played at least 200 minutes in those playoffs, all right? Here's the list of players that scored 30 points for 75 on plus 10, all right? So we scaled them back a little bit. It's only been done in nine different playoffs. LeBron James did it twice. Kevin Durant, Kawhi Leonard, Kareem, Dwayne Wade, Donovan Mitchell, Amari Stoudemire, and Frank Ramsey. I can't give you a scouting report on Frank Ramsey, but Frank Frank Ramsey from the 50s is on that list. That's it. That's the entire list. I I don't even know what to say, Ben. I want to ask you a really big question, question about Booker, and I think it's going to head us to maybe a couple of other players. If you are right now to tell me where you would rank Devin Booker as a scorer, just as a scorer in the NBA, where is he at the moment? Hmm. Uh... I don't know, top seven? I'm trying to think of names. Who We've talked about Embiid and Jokic. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, well here, here's, the, here's the problem with your question, right? Okay. It's yeah. like, it goes back to what I said in, in my opening. 
if you take what he's doing at face value, then you obviously have to discuss him as the best scorer in the sport because these are kind of like unprecedented numbers. I'm still trying to balance the clear improvements that he's made. So you talked about transition. He's gotten a lot of offense in transition in this series, especially the last two games. That's not totally atypical of the way he plays and the way he likes to get his looks. But the one thing I think he's really improved on is his strength and balance and getting to his spots, even at high speeds, hitting the gas, hitting hitting the brakes, stopping, and still having the body control to just get into the elevation he wants with the way his base is set, the way his feet and legs are set, get that strength through the shot. And it creates that beautiful hovering floating sensation that some of these great scorers, Michael Jordan, Kobe, Kawhi Leonard, right? It creates that because other players fly by, you hit the brakes, and then you have that moment in the air where he's so under control, where he just floats it in. And it almost seemed like the basketball was broken at some point in game four because it's like Devin Booker runs down the court at full speed, hits the brakes at 12 feet, goes perfectly straight up in the air, floats it in. Devin Booker runs down the floor, hits the brakes at the free throw line, straight up in the air, floats it in. Devin Booker runs down the floor, hits the brakes at the three point line, straight up in the air, floats it in. Yeah, I mean, it's not a joke. He hit every like he hit like every shot. Uh, So. I'm trying to balance the clear improvement there and what that actually means because we've heard about the ethical 47 points, you know, not getting to the free throw line. Th- that's a thing. If you can't put the type of pressure on the rim regularly, and we did not see that in the first two games, then I think that tough shot making is fantastic, but it's probably going to cap you a little when you compare yourself to the very, very, very best scorers. What's happened in the last two games, and this segues a little bit into this series, is he has been able to break down the defense sometimes at the point of attack. Um, A lot of it, well, I shouldn't say a lot of it, but Bruce Brown at times has struggled to keep him in front of him. KCP, I think, has been a little better, at least in yesterday's game. And coming off the pick and roll action, when they put Jokic as the second if there's two screeners, basically, basically anytime Jokic is involved with his hedge and and he's stepping out on Booker, they've done a pretty good job of containing him. But in isolation or transition, when he can get ahead of steam and get a step on his defender, I think that adds the the extra layer. So if I bought that, that he had great burst and could put a ton of pressure on the basket like Anthony Edwards, then I would be more comfortable with this being sustainable. And I would talk about him as among the best scorers in the league. Um, I think he's probably in the tier behind it, assuming, you know, assuming he just hasn't figured out a way to shoot the basketball better than everyone else on earth. And here's the thing. I, I have a few more numbers to maybe try and add some context to my question, maybe answer it because one player really does stand out from the rest. But I think a key to to wondering about if somebody is the best at something and then you look at a season, it's tough to figure out, like, especially in a small sample size like the playoffs, how much are we looking back to past seasons? Because if you rope in, if you start here, this these playoffs right now, and then you count this, the previous playoffs and the playoffs before, so a three-year stretch right? Devin Booker is scoring about 27 points on plus 2.3. All right. This includes the finals run. This includes them losing um, last year to the to the Mavericks, right? Last year, it was only 25.1. So I guess like the main question there is, do you really think that he's that much better as a scorer last year? Because I don't think he's 13 percentage points better, more efficient than he was last year. Okay. But like that number in general, him collapsing down is more in line with all the other scorers. Because if you look at the top 25 scorers uh, by points per 75 in the last three playoffs, only one of them is shooting above uh, plus five percent from true shoot- shooting, right? Only one of them is shooting five percentage points better than league average from true, true shooting, and that man Ben is Kawhi Leonard, who over the last three playoffs is scoring thirty points per seventy-five on plus ten point eight. Ben, ever of all time in your database, nobody else is doing that. Not a single other player has done that across three playoffs. I know Kawhi Leonard has missed some time. He's been out, but I still put a 500-minute cap on that. He's the only player that has done that over a three-year stretch. Yeah, he's good. 
Yeah, yeah. he's a very good player. So yeah. I guess ultimately when I look at the past few seasons, I'm like, yes, Devin Be- Booker is better than last year. But like, how much better is he than last year? Do you want to know a fun question? Yes. Who is the leading scorer after four games in the Suns Nuggets series? Can I? Can I guess it's? Uh, can I guess it's Jokic? It's it's Nikola Jokic. So yeah. so, um, look, dude, Booker's percentages are just a little bit better. Booker's actually at. 71 percent and Jokic is at 65 but it's just the 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 offense the offense in that last game was just so ridiculous and the there are tactical adjustments that you can make and we talk about them all the time with putting players in positions and changing matchups and different coverages and all this stuff but at a certain point I mean you said you made that comment about Shamit earlier in the show I'm not sure. I, I think actually the Nuggets have to pick their poison and they're very happy making of all the options in some of those sets, making Durant or Booker take a double team or tough mid ranger and skipping it to the corner to the Landry Shamit. Uh, Tory Craig's been out of the lineup, but you know, the, the guys that are kind of in that role, um, uh, Terrence Ross, TJ Warren, those players, I actually think those are probably pretty good shots for them because remember, the Nuggets are still the Nuggets. They still have their offense. Their offensive rating in this series is still like 120 or 121, all right? So I actually think those shots are okay. The difference is the Suns, role play, like if your role player goes six for eight on corner threes, you're just probably going to lose. Um, if Devin Booker and Kevin Durant are shooting literally 60 or 70% on covered mid-range shots. Now, I think Booker did a better job finding openings, especially in transition. But let's not forget Durant. I didn't track it, but Durant made a ton of like incredibly difficult shots yesterday, including this was this was an amazing game. This was kind of a sneaky classic, this game. You had the crazy third quarter. The TNT crew, for some reason, Grant Hill and Spiro Didis, for some reason, they did not call out how many points Jokic had at any point in the first three quarters. So he hits a shot in the third quarter, and someone in the booth finally puts up the little, like, after the score changes, the little graphic on the bottom of the screen. It says, like, Nikola Jokic, 40 points in the third quarter. Just like, what, what is going on in this game? Uh, Durant hits a shot at the end of the first quarter where they Christian Leitner at 80 feet and he catches it and hits this fadeaway from 20 feet. You add up all these things over and over and over again. And there were a number of them in the game. Booker hit the three at the end of the third quarter against the clock. And you're, and, and like, it seems a little unreasonable that it was an extremely close game down the stretch. And it was an extremely close game down the stretch. I think because one of the greatest offensive players of all time on the other side of the court had 53 points and 11 rebounds. <laughs> I just I, I don't even know what to I don't even know what I watched yesterday. And defensively, I do think there's a couple things that the Nuggets could tighten up. Like I think about one of those sham at threes was off uh I think there might have been a double. Maybe Devin Booker swings it to Durant who I think swings it one more to sham it, right? But I think what happened No, it was actually the skip pass that I was referring to earlier. Jamal Murray is splitting the difference between Durant and Shamit, who are on the other side of the court or on the weak side. And Murray What are you gonna do? You gotta you think were you gonna not gonna you're gonna leave Durant? But I don't think it's leaving. I think he needs to do a better job of splitting the difference instead of immediately sprinting to Durant, right? Mm. And I do think that Jamal Murray, some of his decision-making, both on offense and defense, has left a little bit more to be desired. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. The, tr- the true fun of this game was just like the different kinds of scoring that were brought up, like the back and forth between Booker, Durant, hitting these ridiculous like callbacks to Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan shots. And then Jokic, just like you throw it into him, he just kind of like shimmy, hook. Gets it, offensive rebound, score. Three-pointer, bang. Like, nothing flashy, just hits you. All of a sudden, it's 53, which, by the way, is the most points anyone has ever scored in a regulation loss in the playoffs, right? That's a fun little fact for you. Uh, but I think that's that's the interesting thing, because the question, <laughs> the question of Devin Booker being the best, where is he in the best scorer in the, in the league? Ben, I'm not 100% sure he's the best scorer in the series. Let's just <laughs> say that. Let's just say that. Yeah. It's uh I mean there's 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 some serious firepower in this series and I think at a certain point 
if you make the kind of shots you make in this game, you're going to win most playoff games. Uh, you know, I think it's I think it's difficult to without radical changes in tactics to play a game like that and have it be chalked up to anything other than execution at the end of the day and just great players making great plays. Did I see some situations with the Nuggets? Michael Porter Jr. had a couple low man rotations in the first half. I thought he missed. Jamal Murray's decision making, you mentioned it. A a couple that you could maybe question on defense. And there were some possessions where I think the Nuggets could be a little tighter on defense. But for me, this also goes back to stuff like Bruce Brown, especially Contavious Caldwell Pope. You, if you're going to play like this, I think you have to keep the ball out of the paint and keep some of these penetrators in front of you. Uh, a good example here would be the Suns getting addition by subtraction with Chris Paul coming out of this series. Chris Paul struggling in the first two games, and you could make the argument that he's eating up oxygen from Booker and Durant at the point of attack. They bring in campaign. He naturally moves off ball. But the one thing campaign done has done really well to me is push and pace and push and transition. And there were a number of plays in game three, especially in the first half, where he there was one on a make where he got it, zoomed it ahead, passed to a cutting Josh Okogie layup. I think he had a three in transition. He himself has created his own offense in transition at the basket by pushing it. So these are things on the Denver side where you're like, this is, a, this is an NBA championship level playoff game. We got to get back in transition. We have to off a of make. We have to know where we're going to be um, in the half court. We have to keep our guy in front of us. We have to be a half a step better than our opponents. And then on offense, again, leaving just a, leaving aside small tactical changes going forward, on offense, possessions like Jamal Murray dribbling out the clock. Or I think there was one in, it might have been back in game three, whenever that was. I get, That was Friday, right? I think <laughs> it's, so. it's, yeah, it's, all, yeah. it's, it's all blurring together. Um, there was one at the end of game three where I think he had Booker. Yep. Booker had switched onto Jokic. And Jokic had him in the post. And Murray, instead of entering him to the post... I think Booker had four or five fouls at that point in the game as well. Uh, instead of entering him into the post, Murray backed it out, dribbled around and tried to attack Aiton and got a poor shot out of it. Those little things, right? That Those are places where you can improve on the margins and somehow even win a game like this when the other guy shoots 82% from the outside and, and the role players make all the threes. And so in that sense, I think it's an encouraging sign for Denver, but on the flip side, if if the Phoenix guys are going to shoot uh, and kind of continue, as you pointed out, to execute better and better against these defensive coverages, it's it's going to be a fun game five. And we didn't we didn't talk about Friday's game at all because obviously we haven't potted yet. But it was clear that their their strategy was just to attack the basket more and push the pace more. Kevin Durant had like 16 free throw attempts in game three, whereas like the most he had had before that was 11, and he shot like 12 free throws in the first half of that game. Like it was clear that Booker and Durant were like, all right, we're not just going to be settling, even though clearly from Booker's shooting percentages, they can they can certainly settle. I just want to point out that we were planning on talking about the Celtics and 76ers today, but I see we've already made it like 20, 25 (laughs) minutes into the episode. I just want to acknowledge that it's happening again because I'm looking at my board here, Cody, and I do want to spend a little bit more time on the Western Conference and I have more players in the Western Conference, but I have a few few guys that jump out to me from this New York-Miami series Hmm. that I want to discuss. Um... I just have to mention it for the for the podcast listeners that have been with us all year. The stock is down. It hurts me. It hurts me inside to say this. The stock is down right now on Quentin Grimes and Emmanuel Quickly. They've 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 struggled in the postseason. How much of that is opportunity? How much of that is? Um, I mean, for me, I think Josh Hart getting like forty minutes a game versus trying to put one or both of those guys in a position. Uh, Like, take Grimes, for instance. He comes in in game four. He actually makes a shot and has a couple productive plays. And then he's back to the bench like three minutes later because the rotation stint was so short. I think it's very hard for a player like that to get a rhythm in in a really short rotation stint. So 
I don't know how strongly I feel about this is my whole point because it might just be circumstance. It might just be coming off a little injury in Rhymes' case with the shoulder or whatever. But uh, it, it has been a big thing for me in this series because I was expecting to have more New York options, including quickly and even Grimes, along with Brunson and Hart and Randall coming back. Randall has had a seriously bumpy road um, again in the playoffs coming off of the ankle injury. You take Grimes and quickly out of the equation and the Knicks just the Knicks just really, really struggled to get good offensive production and, and good offensive process uh, in game four of that series. So that's the downside there. Um, the upside in that series stock going up is Jimmy Butler from the university of Marquette. I, 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 is this the fourth year in a row? We're like, I don't know what to make of Jimmy Butler. I feel like we've been saying this since he's been in Miami where his bubble run in 2020 was like, how did he do that game? Wait, Jimmy Butler had 12 points. Where was he in that game? How did he do that game? Why did Jimmy Butler only have 14 points in this game? Uh, 2021, he averages 14 points per game in the entire playoff series against Milwaukee when they're swept. Last year, it was the same thing. He had these huge games in the playoffs, especially in the Eastern Conference Finals, and then he'd follow it up with like eight points or six points or something like that. I know people were talking about a, a sore knee and whatnot. I know he had some some bumps and bruises at certain points in the series. This season, we haven't even had a like a really down Jimmy Butler game. He just sprains his ankle and comes back and plays great. Like how how good is how high are you on Jimmy Butler right now? How good is he? Oh, I mean, he's the goat. He's probably the best player that's <laughs> ever played basketball. I mean, we saw him take Stop out it. the champs and maybe the best player in the league at Giannis. So, but no, Stop in, it. In, in all seriousness, though, the thing about Jimmy Butler and I, I ask this in earnestness because I've, I've thought about this before. Um, averages when you look at because like everyone looks at averages when it comes to to sports right and it depends on the kinds of averages like you can pull a basketball reference maybe you go to the per 100s maybe you just do the per games maybe we're going to thinking basketball and looking at the per 75 types of stats right but that just tells you like on average this is what the players are are doing should do you think like it's the future or at least something that that statisticians stat folk should look into should we start just communicating variance a little bit more in players' game-to-game -game performances, like maybe instead of like a single number, like what if you just had like the bell curve? Like this is the range that they score two-thirds of the time, like from this to this. Like Kevin Durant, just off the top of my head from his career, would just have like the smallest amount. It's like he scores 27 or 28, like two-thirds of his game, period. Whereas Jimmy Butler, it's like, I don't know, he scores 20 or 30 two-thirds of the time. Like would that actually be a more useful way to communicate how – how a player is performing over the course of a certain time span? Eh, I, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think I think it's still somewhat negligible. I mean, if you're, let's think about it. If you're a team and you're scouting a player, does it help to know that he's a 28 point per game scorer versus sometimes he scores 10, but other times he'll get really hot? Um, I don't know. Maybe. Maybe that helps. If if the player is on your team, how much does that help? If you're in the front office and like many fans, you're trying to analyze the value of a player and the fit of a player in a certain situation, how much does that variance help versus just averages, which are going to be pretty close to variance? I mean, years ago, Cody, I used to do this. I used to take the distribution of scoring quality and graph it and I'd put LeBron up and I'd put Kobe up and you could see, oh, this guy's more consistent and this guy has, has higher variance and he's got these big hit or miss games. The only thing I've ever seen in terms of driving wins, and I think I mentioned this in Thinking Basketball, the book, it was some research done by our friend Neil Payne when he worked at Basketball Reference. And he looked at higher variance players. So you have higher highs, essentially, and lower lows. You're kind of undulating great game, bad game, great game, bad game versus a consistent player. They both average like 30 points a game, but one gets 45 on one night and then 15 on the next night. The other's constantly scoring 30. And what he found was basically, if you have a good team, you want consistency because those lows avoid pulling you down and making you susceptible to an upset. Uh, you have a, you have a big time leading scorer, and he takes a bunch of shots and has an off night. He drags the team down a bit. Whereas if you're a, the weak team and you're like an eight seed, 
and you've got one of these guys that can go nuclear, you can potentially spike your win probability against better teams because now the big 40 or 50 point game on efficient shooting is pulling your team and your offense up regardless of the quality of the competition. I think especially, by the way, you know, a simulation like that probably didn't include that. Cody, if you have one of these guys that can go nuclear against the very best competition, that probably matters, but I fold that into the average as well, right? Like I would think about that as score A, forget variance, can he do it against the best teams? And if he can do it against the best teams, then I know I'm going to be able to get a lot of value out of his scoring or overall play at the highest level versus, um, I'll try, I just won't call anyone out. I'm not, I'm not in a negative Nancy mood. So I'll just, I'll just say in general, a player who has a hard time when you get to the playoffs, actually, you know, scoring 30 points at 60% true shooting. What does that, does that answer your question? Yeah. What's the opposite of a negative Nancy? Is it, is it a positive Pete? A po- a po- <laughs> positive Pete? I was going to say positive Paul. Oh, that's yeah. better. Yeah, you like that's that? better alliteration for sure. Yeah. I think if I was looking at variance, I feel like. Maybe it's just me. I'm a risk-averse person, Ben. I just genuinely am. I feel like I'd want players that that are a lot more consistent, like especially my best players. Like, I don't know. Even if it's not a very good team, I would at least know that my baseline is looking good. Maybe I would take a flyer on, like, my seventh man because, you know, once in a while it would be nice to be like, oh, yeah, our six-point-per-game score might drop 23 this game. Like, I think that would be nice to bring off the bench once in a while, but I think in general – like, I would just want guys with, with low variance. And I, I would be really interested to pilot that and just, like, track that and see how it is. And uh, I don't know. That's that's how I feel about it. Okay. So um, we still didn't get an answer on Jimmy Butler from you. What's the – what's the see I, see, I just don't know what to make of Jimmy Butler. I've had him in my top 10 end player season uh, valuations twice yep. in the last three years. And I don't have the list off the top of my head, but I wouldn't be surprised if he's there again Mm -hmm. this season. He's certainly playing at that level and has showed he's capable of playing at that level. Do do you see anything in this playoffs in particular that legit makes you think like this is one of the best four or five players in the league? And if he played like this in the regular season, we we really should be talking about Jimmy at the MVP level of top tier, you know, all NBA first team players. You know, when you say the top, I, for for the record, just to start off, I think if, if we're doing the stock thing here, like it's it's exactly the same for me. Like I'm I'm holding on that. I'm not going up or down. This is kind of exact. Like I joke about it, but I kind of expected this going to the playoffs. Like if I see Jimmy performing like this, I'm like, yeah, whatever. We've seen it a couple times. He's but up. Think- he's he's up for me. He's up for me. I I continue to take okay. the you know a new block of sample in a new year, and I go okay. Every time he does it, it's a little bit more valid for me. So okay. it's it's trending up. That's fair. I, I like that. It's like we've seen it before, but now we've seen it more. Therefore, it's something that's more real. But when you say like the top four or five players, like immediately off the top of my head, no order. Like, you know, Jokic, Giannis, Curry, Embiid, Luka, Durant. Like all of a sudden, you know, five or six right there. So I don't think he's – I just don't feel like he's in that category. I feel like once you start getting to Jason Tatum, I still think I would rather Jason Tatum because of the consistency thing. So if we go like a step below that – where are we? Like the, the, I don't know, was Devin Booker in that? Like are we in Shea Gildas Alexander area? Like, I feel like that category, you're shaking your head. You don't like Shea being in that category. Not for me. No. no. Not, not, not yet. Me. Okay. Yeah. Not yet. Yeah. So I think Butler is wherever that is, probably right around that range for me. I also just have a difficult time, like, figuring out when Jimmy Butler's peak actually is, because I don't feel like he had these explosive playoffs <laughs> until the bubble. But I also thought he was. I don't know, like the Philadelphia run, I kind of feel like that might have been when he was altogether just the best player. Like the motor was higher. He was more consistent. I think he shot threes more, but also his passing peaked as he got older. So I, I just don't know how to nail down Jimmy Butler as a player. Yeah, that's uh, some somewhat how I feel. He's a very interesting player. He mm. just, the way he uses his body and scores in transition and He's a good passer, cutter, screener, rebounding instincts. He's a very interesting player. Um, let's let's continue. Let's talk about, I think, the other guy that you left out of your list of the top players on the planet. Uh, well, yeah, you actually left. Did you leave Giannis off your list, or did you say Giannis? I thought I, thought I said Giannis, didn't okay, I? Okay, all right. You said Giannis, but if you I didn't... didn't I, I meant to say Giannis. Everyone can calm down. Um, well, you didn't say Anthony Davis. Oh, who, okay. It, Yes, who is another guy who um, 
is certainly trending up. Now, now it's hard for me because as uh, longtime listeners know, a few years ago, I was higher on Anthony Davis than anyone going back to 2018, 2019, even before he got to the Lakers. And then you have this, in, this issue with his injuries and his health and how his body's changed and how he's aged and, and wear and tear. So I don't think this is peak Anthony Davis. But at the same time, I also feel like there is an upward kind of stock taking in this sample that I've seen since the playoffs started for me that says, time out look at Anthony Davis now and then make him better. Um, How many players on earth are actually better than that? How many, like you, you listed five or six or seven players. Why wouldn't Anthony Davis be in that, in that conversation at least? Okay. I I think this, this bleeds into the, the variance conversation though. Cause when I read his numbers, Ben 21 points per 75 plus two efficiency, Box creation, he's creating three shots per 100 possessions for his teammates. So that's not that's not like eye popping. I mean, he and he and Rui are the only two players on the Lakers that are shooting over uh, neutral efficiency for the Lakers, right? Like oh, across the board, no one's being particularly efficient. And I don't know if that's just because the playoffs are so much different than than the regular season. Who knows what the case is? Some of these these series are rock fights, but it's the same kind of thing with Jimmy Butler. Like if you take the specific games, yes. Like Anthony Davis, when he's at his peak, he's in the top five for me. But Anthony Davis, when he's not in his peak, would even be in the top ten. So it's like I don't know. I forgot. I forgot who tweeted it. Uh, Sam Quinn, Sam Quinn of uh, CBS Sports, I believe, tweeted it, and it was about his his even and odd game performances. And uh, as I as I as I stall for a second, stutter and stall and vamp and figure out what's going on. What's happening? I, what are you what, what are you doing? What's going I'm, on? I'm loading a tweet right now, Ben. I'm trying to wait for the computer to work because Sam. <laughs> tweets he says that in odd games in the playoffs anthony davis is aver- davis is averaging 27.8 points per game and 16.8 rebounds per game in even numbered games he's averaging 13 points and 10 rebounds a game like those are two entirely different players this is the I'd, variance thing that i'm talking about no i don't care what, i don't care about that do you one you don't bit. care what's yeah, happening I don't, I don't care about that at all what yeah tell yeah. me why i i'm baffled what if i told you Ooh. that most of Anthony Davis's value comes from defense. And those cute little those cute little nerd numbers that you just read to us, they they have nothing to do with defense. And this idea that he's radically inconsistent is borderline silly because yes, yes, in the nine what do they play? Nine playoff games? Uh eight? eight? Yes. Nine nine, play nine playoff games. Nine playoff games. In the nine playoff games. Uh, I just did a video on Anthony Davis. I counted six hits and three misses. And even the third miss, it's debatable depending on how you want to look at his defense. So yes, there have been some insane performances coupled with a couple, you know, down performances that has existed. But this to me as a player, you've seen it in this game, in in this series. We're three games into the series. Everything in the series is centered around Anthony Davis on both ends of the court. And you could say the same thing about Steph Curry, but I think at this point that's that's a given. Um, as an aside, has, has Steph Curry's stock gone up for you in these playoffs with, with what you've seen in the last couple of weeks? No, it's the same. It's the same. See, I sometimes, I, I get so much flack for, again, Anthony Davis is really good. Nikola Jokic is really good. Steph Curry is really good. I get so much flack for saying that players are good that after a long time of not thinking about them, I almost wonder, like, do we still underrate Curry because of some of the things we've seen? He dictates everything in a series. He seems to have every answer every time. And the the thing that's been floating around in my brain lately and the reason why I, I wanted to ask you about it is we know about the off-ball stuff. We know about the movement and the shooting. But his ability to toggle back and forth between on-ball and off-ball and his command and control of the game that we saw in Game 7 against uh, Sacramento, and then we saw the exact same thing in Game 2 against Los Angeles, and who knows what we're going to see in Game 4 or Game 5. It feels like the ultimate kind of basketball playoff weapon to be able to respond to any kind of defense. So I'm loving this series because it's like Steph Curry's offense on one side – Anthony Davis's defense and and the response to the sort of 
uh, push and pull of that dance. But you mentioned some numbers, Cody. They were also from our Thinking Basketball database. They were very cute. You said something like three shots created for 100, right? Yeah, yes. Okay, what that does not account for, because despite that stat trying to account for some off-ball gravity and influence, what that doesn't account for in the case of Davis, because he's such so atypical as a big man, is he's dictating all the matchups. So the Warriors don't want to go small because of him. The Lakers, uh, his screen gravity and his role gravity, I'm not sure there's been a player. Can you think of a player in the modern game who has had the kind of role gravity that Anthony Davis has had that we've seen when he's been on this season where teams were, there were some teams during the regular season that were bringing a third defender over to double team his screen. Basically, they're like, no, we cannot let this guy get behind us. So in a series like this, where you're trying to respond to his defense by attacking offensively, his offensive skills then dictate how much you can cheat the lineup and everything the Lakers run, like we're going to put Davis in screening action, whether it's uh, D'Angelo Russell or LeBron James, it's still centered around him getting switches, the way the defense responds to those switches, and um, sort of the the gravity that his role game brings to the table. I'm not phased by... See, to me, the 13-point night is just that his shot was off, and his shot goes into the inconsistent category for me. So we talked about Jimmy Butler... We talked about Devin Booker. Anthony Davis shot like 55% from the mid-range in the bubble. It was surreal. It was ridiculous. Um, I think going back, I would lower my valuation a touch because I don't think he can shoot that well. But I don't know if you've checked, Cody, but he's shooting the same again in this postseason. Mm -hmm. And it's like, what are you going to do? I understand the overall scoring numbers aren't, you know... 30 points per game right now, just based on the the context of the team and the way things are playing out. But I think he's the centerpiece of a lot of what's going on offensively. And if he's going to make his mid range shot, what do you, what, what's your answer defensively? I think that's what you have to concede. I think the thing, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you're going to tell me I'm incorrect about this, but the thing about the top guys, if we're still talking about why isn't he in that upper echelon, the top four or five guys, I feel like the the Jokic's, the Giannis's, the Embiid's, they offer a significant amount of floor raising and ceiling raising, right? Like I feel like if you you surround them with you surround them with players that are you know. Uh, I don't know how to say this politely. Not the best, right? Not all-star level players, a bunch of role players. You can still squeeze out a good team, right? Like you can sit, you can send some bench lineups around them. They're doing well. Whereas Anthony Davis, he excels as sort of, I think in your your profile of him many moons ago, uh, a hybrid player, right? And I think that's when you called him maybe the best lob threat in NBA history. And so, you know, I think both of us very much value the fact that you can play other play next to really high on talent. But also when you're at the top, I value the fact that you can raise the floor a little bit. And offensively, I just don't think he brings enough juice to get him there. So I think even if we're, we're not, we're leaving like the variance aspect of it aside, that's part of it where I'm like, he's, I don't know, I need to see it a little bit more in that context. I, I, I think he's clearly weaker offensively than... Uh, who else did we put in? Let's let's say let's say Joel Embiid. I think yep. he's clearly weaker yes. than Joel Embiid offensively. And then there's a whole nother level to get up to someone like Jokic or Curry. Um, but but the reason I say that is I think you're potentially getting so much defensive value ahead of even a player like Joel Embiid. Like Joel Embiid is a good defender. Mm-hmm. Right. And we've seen in this series against the Celtics. Wait a second. Wait a second. Are we going to talk about this series? Is this going to happen? The what? The, the Celtics and the 76ers. His rim protection at times has been fantastic. Uh, just coming over, erasing shots, altering shots. Um, wait, we already talked about it. We talked about this recently. I, I had this whole thing about how he was moving well, coming off the ankle. Yeah, we talked yeah. about that. You're right. Yeah. Okay. So, so we have talked about this series. Um, We have talked about his rim protection, but he's still a more limited defender. He's still slower. He's a bigger body. He still wants to be in drop more than playing various different coverages. And that also means he's not as switchable. So the difference in the playoffs to me between like what we're seeing from Anthony Davis or peak Anthony Davis, if you even go back to the bubble 
and like this version of Joel Embiid right now is this a pretty significant value add on defense there there have been people that are asking me like is this one of the greatest defensive peaks of all time I wouldn't be opposed to having that conversation about Mm -hmm. Anthony Davis in the playoffs at his best is an all-time type level defender you scale that back to Embiid who for me is probably just like a ho-hum oh I'm only an all defensive quality you know like a second team all defensive quality guy or something that's that's a pretty big gap don't you think what about what about Giannis defensively? Like, how much of a gap do you see between those two guys? He, I think he sits between the two of them. I think Giannis is closer to AD. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I think um, this version of AD is still more diverse than Giannis, so I would give him a little extra value in the postseason. But I think Giannis is much closer. Again, I think the thing that I'm struggling with here is you you even had to qualify it multiple times. You're like, this version of AD in the playoffs, when he's on, and I'm like, yeah, but guys like Giannis, he carries that value throughout the regular season quite a bit, right? And I don't know if that like weighs into it at all because I just I don't remember watching Anthony Davis during the regular season being like, this is the best defensive player in the league, right? Well, yeah, no, I think that's true because uh, to me – physically when the playoffs started that was the best he's he looked in three years so if there's a ton going on with his health and recovering from health I look I still don't know what to entirely make of it because he's had a lot of injuries a lot of time has passed he's gained weight this is a different physical specimen than in 2018 2019 when we saw him in New Orleans and he was springy and fly and things like that so I, I, I don't know um but hey, Cody, we're doing stock up, stock down. And the last month from what I've seen from Anthony Davis is, uh, is let's put it this way. Your last comment about, I didn't think this in the regular season, neither did I. And now we're talking about it. So yeah. if, if that's how he's actually going to play, that one, that's stock up to me. And two, I do think we have to talk about him as, he, I, I don't know how he can be that far behind this conversation with the best players. Okay, can I let's I want to steer this a certain way. We can we could talk about this player for like a minute and a half. But based on what you just said about Anthony Davis, I want to hear what your thoughts are on this guy. Is it LeBron we, James? No. Oh, no. okay. Actually Kawhi Leonard. W- where would your stock be with him? Up. Even plays two games. Yes. Knee takes him out. He's done. Clippers have a chance to win the series and they don't. Well, he didn't play, I don't think in the last year's playoffs. He's left multiple playoffs. It's up Ben. Well, for me, I always have this reservation about his injuries. So that's a consistent. So when I'm seeing him healthy, do I continue to see 30 plus 10, um, just total resilient tempo control of a playoff series? Seemingly now, now Phoenix's defense doesn't exactly inspire me, but it doesn't matter. Kawhi without Paul George in the situation that they were in for those two games was incredibly impressive from a process standpoint, from possession to possession, and then you check the box score and you're like, oh, he shoots 70%. So to me, this spans back to like 2017, which there's a ton of injuries. And look, if you're making, uh, I, don't, I don't know, I'm listening to too much Hubie Brown. I don't know what I'm saying. Look, number one, okay, if you're making, <laughs> um, but if you're, if you're doing like historical analysis or you're retrograding sort of team value on a contract, Kawhi Leonard has been healthy for two playoffs in like seven or eight years. It is all-time historical omission, absences, right? What, what do you guys like to call that in school? Your truancy rate? Um, I mean, it is, it is, it, 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 it's an issue. It's, a, it's really, really an issue. It's like, it's like when, you, when you stack it up and you go, wow, Grant Hill had more like healthy prime playoff runs than Kawhi Leonard. That's an issue, but that's, that's a consistent to me. The reason why I would say up is that just every time he shows up in the postseason, he delivers. So I'm like, okay, just like Anthony Davis, if your healthy value is going to be this good, that gives me more of a sample to be confident that I'm evaluating you at the right level versus just, you know, Devin Booker, the, the greatest two, like two game shooting stretch ever. But we know two game shooting stretches like that 
uh, even when they don't happen, like this is not going to last. What I'm looking for is how much, how much has he actually leveled up in defense, playmaking, decision-making, balance, strength to get the shot quality. And then you'll see a sustained spike in, in the stats over a hundred games, not just two games. I think I, Ben, this is the first time that I finally figured out where I think you and I completely disagree on something. I think philosophically, uh, to, to quote Ben Golliver back when he was on the Open Floor podcast, he used to say availability is the best ability. And I think I agree with that. And I think I agree with it more than you do right now. And this goes back even to our previous MVP, maybe not even MVP conversation, our all-star conversation, where you're like, yeah, if Kareem plays like five amazing games and gets voted in, he should be because the all-star game should be about who the best players are. Whereas I'm like, I'm factoring the fact that you play into how good of a player you are. So based on all of this, Ben, my Kawhi stocks actually dropped because I'm like, great, you can play for two games, but how much va- how much value is that actually for my team? So uh, because of the availability aspect of it, Kawhi's, Kawhi's stock is down for me. That's rough. That's, that's brutal. Um, I'm going to hit you back with this one. Okay. LeBron James down a little bit. Okay. Um, yeah. <sighs> How how injured like how much did the LeBron James feet help LeBron James's feet Ben? Okay, okay. Here's the thing. This is so hypocritical based on what I just said because because LeBron is injured and I think yeah. that's why I think that's why he's not quite as punchy uh, physically mm-hmm. as he has been in the past even though he's 38 years old. I think he's in a great great condition and I think he has a higher level, but since this injury, he has not moved as well, and it's taken some stuff off the table for him. He's still very good. He's still very good. But I do think we have to acknowledge, going back to where he was, like, say, a year ago, um, I think he's not as good. But the hypocritical part is I'm saying I'm saying he's not healthy. So why why is the stock... I, I didn't I didn't say stock anything. I didn't answer yet, Ben. I was just I was just asking questions. You know, I'm just I'm just the dude in the lecture, just asking the questions. Ben. No, I'm saying I have his stock going down, but that that's hypocritical. Oh, I thought you were calling I, me hypocritical. Okay, no, I'm sense. saying myself. I'm saying yep. myself. But the reason why I I in my brain it's stock down is because he's so old that he is, he's younger than me. LeBron is so old. Um, <laughs> he, he can't even tie his shoes anymore. No, I, I'm saying like, it's it's relevant to me because I'm assuming that something like this isn't easy to bounce back from versus if you're 27 or 30 years old or whatever, that you can reattain a health. Exactly what we saw with Anthony Davis. You can reattain a healthy level that's close to where you were the year or two prior to the injury. Yeah, I I love LeBron James, Ben. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that as like a. As I like think you said that. I think you've said that like in seven separate episodes of this show. I think everyone knows that well, uh, you're a Stan. This is for the Lakers fans who like uh, just have us completely under a microscope. I just got to put that out there. I'm a big LeBron James fan. His stock is down for me. Like not that sounds like this is so negative, but it's just one of those things where it's like, all right. Now that LeBron's missed the playoffs for a couple of years, let's see if playoff LeBron is a thing. And I know he's injured and everything else, but playoff LeBron right now is just not quite a thing. I, I just fell on the sword for you, and then you took you you took the sword and you stabbed it into yourself. You could have gotten off scot free. The people they come here for the. Tr- I'm a truth speaker, Ben. That's what I'm here thinking. They the would they, they would have completely come after me on that one. Um, let, let's see who's who's left. What can we talk about? Wow, this hour has gone by. Yeah. Quickly. I think I let's do I want to do a Golden State one. I want to do a Golden State one. Okay? okay? And I will just say the names and then if you want to move on and we can talk about we can wrap up with a little series analysis, we can tell me more players you have stock thoughts on, but Golden State is interesting to me because this is the second straight postseason where Kevon Looney is like a rock and there's still weaknesses and you see it in this series as a non-shooter and speed and things like that, but the guy's such a professional. He just does his job. He's so solid in his role. To me, that's stock up because you get a, you just get like confirmation of them. Like, man, that Kavon Looney, he's something special. And then stock down, and it's and it's and it's a big issue for this team potentially going forward in the rest of this series. And if they make it to to one of the final four series, um, Jordan Poole. Last year in the playoffs, he was a key offensive piece. He had a number of good games. He shot well. His decision-making, which can always be a little spicy, let's put it that way, he plays a little bit on the edge, um, 
it's been, to me, significantly worse in these playoffs than it was last year. And what that has done, effectively, is it's taken a dangerous piece. It's taken one of the pieces off of Steve Kerr's chessboard a little bit because it's like, it's like, oh, I had this rook that can't, we're going to, let's do a chess metaphor. Can we, can we do a chess metaphor? Oh, we can Is do that chess. okay? Yeah. That's okay. a good sport. So, yeah. Right. <laughs> Cody doesn't watch other sports, but he watches chess. Um, are you a big Ding, Ding Liren fan? Uh, I'm a big Queen's Gambit fan. Okay. So, <laughs> so uh, it's like, it's like having this rook in the corner that just occupies an entire rank or file. And then, you know, that piece gets downgraded to like a knight or something. And you're like, okay, every once in a while, this can, I can hop this around the board and, and do some dangerous things. But for the most part, it's, it's, I'm down a weapon compared to what I had, or some chess guy is going to be like, Ben, there are situations where the knight is better than the rook. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, I don't want to call Jordan Poole a pawn. People will get upset who don't play chess. It feels like when we talk about chess, like the the rook has less variance than, say, the knight, because I feel like the knight, you have to really be set up like you just have the entire straight row to go with. I, I like that lack of variance there for Jordan Poole, because here's the thing I'm thinking about last year, too. Um, defense. Defense was, was rocky last year. It was not very good. It's not very good this year. Where do you see the drop off? Is it is it the scoring efficiency? Is it the burst? Is it the decision making? Like what sort of thing makes you even lower on him? I think the decision making, um, and maybe even on both ends, because I think his defense has slipped as well. And it's it's stuff like not just focus, but how I position myself at a screen and the judgment I take sort of like jumping to the ball or taking a gamble or a risk or where I place myself. All, I, I think all those things have been a little leakier than they were in the past. Um, anyone else, anything else we have to talk about before we, we get out of here? Yeah. What, I, what are you thinking? I got, okay. I got two names, two names. They used to be teammates. Um, they used to be teammates twice over. Actually. This is, this is for stock stuff still. Th- this is for stock stuff still. Okay. James Harden. Same to me. Same. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But I do think I do think if you're someone who's like, oh, this James Harden, he's a big he's a big phony baloney choker and he can't do it in the playoffs, uh, I I would hope that these I mean what he's had two really great games in this Boston series against a really good Celtics team, and those have basically created the wins. I, I was thinking watching rewatching that Philadelphia Boston game, which I somehow still haven't seen all four quarters. I've seen like the fourth quarter and overtime and like the first half. I still haven't seen the entire game. Um, I was thinking, this is crazy that the Celtics played the Nets last year. They had a very close series and they won all the close games and it was a sweep. But this year they're playing Philadelphia and they lost game one at the end of the game and they lost game four at the end of the game. And so instead of a sweep, it's 2-2. And the difference between saying those things theoretically as a, as a person, the way we respond to that. Like when I tell people that, I'm like, you know, that, that Brooklyn Nets series, that was a closer series. And they, they just look at you like you have three heads. They're like, what do you mean? And you can show them the stats. You can, they say, it doesn't matter. So I, I saw that series. Boston took, took the Nets' soul. They stomped them into the earth and they completely shut Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving down. Versus this series, which is almost like the exact same thing. Very similar but Philadelphia wins both of those close games. And instead of a sweep, you have 2-2. And implied in that, especially in this case, because I think uh, Philly's pretty solid, uh, credit, credit to, by the way, to the Philadelphia role players. I like what they've done. Ma- uh, not just Maxi, but really DeAnthony Melton minutes and even someone who I've never been super high on. Tobias Harris, I think, has had pretty good minutes. And so you get this like idea of the 76ers team with Harden, doing hardened things. And he's clearly done that at times in this series. He got a lot of criticism in game three for being too passive. And that may have been the case with his own scoring, but games two and three and bead comes back. It's a different defensive structure. They put Jalen Brown on him comes back in game four. Uh, I loved the way he played in that game. One play that really jumped out that just a, just a tactical kind of move that I wanted to mention before we get out of here. They were using like a screen before the screen to get someone like Jalen Brown 
off of Harden. So you, you can move the primary defender off because Boston switches so much. Boston just soft switches everything. And so all of a sudden now you have Grant Williams switched onto Harden. Rob Williams was the screen defender. And now you have two slower players that Harden could navigate, move, get into the mid-range. He was using the mid-range in this game, which we've talked about before, how, how important that extra counter is to have in the postseason. So he's been great. You got Harden and Embiid. You got the role players coming together. 2-2 two, two series. Could, could kind of go either way. You could see it going either way. Um, I don't remember how we started on this, but to, yeah. No, Harden, stock up, stock down. And then I have well, a to me, to me, to me, it's the same because I've never, I've never bought into the idea of him being, you know, some choker who can't win in the playoffs. Even if at the, even if I don't think his regular season performance is indicative of his his playoff performance. Okay. Um, two things about that series. I know we want to get out of here, but I have a take that's going to flirt with like a morning show hot take sort of situation. But I'm going to, I'm going to steer it in a different direction. Uh, number one. Tatum and Horford masterclass defensive performance, especially in that fourth quarter. That was awesome. We could have talked half an hour about that. Number two, this this is my flirting with a hot take. The not calling a timeout at the ends of games. You know, when the coach lets them play, like every time, the color commentator's like, he's letting him play. You know, every single time. I feel like Phil Jackson, I don't know if he was the first one, but I feel like Phil Jackson's the one where it's like, Phil Jackson lets him play it out. He doesn't call a timeout and things like this. The, the not calling a timeout in those situations feels like a good arts, good hearts law at this point, where it's like the measure of a good coach is, is the fact that they don't call a timeout in those situations. Whereas I feel like it actually, you know, that's the thing that good coaches use. It's not the way to become a good coach. And I'm starting to get sick of it, right? Just, I don't know. That, that's my take. Like, not calling a timeout doesn't make you a great coach. That's all I got to say about that. Good hearts law, when the, when the measure becomes the target. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I mean, I liked it. I liked it. The problem with the, the, the Celtics, the Celtics just should have gone earlier. I have no problem with no timeout. You just, if you have 15 seconds left at the end of the game and you want to go without a timeout, you still have to go. You still have to do the go part. They, they were like, they were like, let's wait 14 seconds and then maybe we'll shoot. And so you go from a situation where you could get two cracks at it because you're down by one. So if you miss and foul, it's a two or three point game potentially. Um, you get two cracks at it, and the Celtics got zero cracks at it. So I, I, I was good with the no timeout personally. You know, I, I'm not commenting specifically on that. I'm just saying we don't have to do the no timeout thing to show that you're a good coach. We just don't anymore. Oh, I thought people. I'm sorry. I thought people were critical. I thought people were saying when you have no timeout, that's that's a demerit. Wait, wait. You're you're saying that if you don't call a timeout, it's a good thing. No, I'm saying you're people. Saying the opposite. I'm saying that was my impression that people are very critical if you don't call a timeout. Oh, I think like it feels like a thing that good coaches do, though. Is my point. Like I'm just okay. critical of it in general, not any specific time it happens. It's like it's like a meta commentary on the not calling timeout thing. Okay. Is there is there any series that we missed? Uh, I don't. I can't keep track of what's happening. I'm gonna I'm gonna be very honest. We started this podcast talking about basketball, and then we finished talking about chess, right? Yeah. <laughs> and that's, yeah, I, I, I got nothing. I got nothing on that. I think, we, I think we hit all of them. I think maybe we could have talked about Heat Knicks more, but I didn't see Game 3, and I also heard Game 3 wasn't actually a basketball uh, game. So. Man, Game 3 was, oh, man, that was, uh, that was an ugly game. Game 4 is coming up tonight. We'll see if there are any tactical adjustments coming out of that one. We'll, we'll get to those later in the week and by the time we return Cody we will be through five games of these series Lakers and uh, Warriors tonight and then again on Wednesday with this same double header so that should be extremely exciting if you want to support this podcast directly we do have finally our uh, playoff stats board up it is it is popping it is sexy we've added shot charts we've added a a few other things there's a there's a ton going on i mean cody talked about it you just pull up the leaders devin booker is the leader in playoff box plus minus he's putting up an historically great number as you might expect uh, nikola Jokic is is right behind him uh patreon.com slash thinking basketball sign up as a deluxe member you get access to that board that updates daily otherwise thanks as always for listening all the way through on this episode and that wherever you are i do hope you are having a great day